single track magazine and singletrackworld.com and welcome to fresh goods down under now this is a live q a chat this is a weekly video that i'm doing every friday morning in australia uh, if you're in the uk that might be thursday or is thursday evening if you're in the us it's sometime during thursday um, and if you're in other parts of the world well you're at other times of the day also. I can't work out those times. It depends where you are. And if you are tuning in, I'd love to hear whereabouts you're watching from. Um, we're trying to do this video every Friday. So if you want to join us, it's going to be at the same time every Friday. We're going to talk about test bikes that I've got on the go. We're going to talk about test product that we have on the go as well. Um, and also just general news stories that have hit single track this week. There's been loads and loads of new product releases in the past week. I've got loads and loads and loads to chat about. I've got loads of notes here. Um, I do want to have a bit of a chat about some of the stuff I've got on this bike and also some of the setup changes I've made to this test bike. This is a Giant Trance 29er and uh, I've had this for a couple of weeks now, about three weeks. So a bit of riding on it so far and a good chance to compare it to other test bikes like the Canyon Neuron CF, which I'm just about to wrap up with. Um, also receiving a Merida 120 trail bike, Pivot uh, Trail 429, uh, White S120, loads of uh, trail bikes that I'm testing at the moment brand, that are brand new, um, including this one here. So if you've got any questions for me about this test bike and any of the stuff that's on here that we're going to go through today, drop them in the comments section below. This is a live video. Um, I have my wonderful uh, phone in front of me here so I can answer any questions you've got. Um, whether they're about this bike or just any general questions you've got otherwise. So if you've got any setup questions or you're looking at getting a new bike. Oh, we've got a good morning there from uh, Tonio, Ton Tonio Boy. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for joining and thanks for tuning in. Um, let me know whereabouts you're watching from. We've got, a, we've got a few people here tuning in. I can see that up there. Welcome. Th thanks for joining us on uh, Fresh Goods Down Under. This is apparently episode seven. And I was just saying before, they're gonna be doing this Friday morning uh, video um, every week. So uh, so please, uh, oh, we've got someone there tuning in from Switzerland. Hello, uh, Timothy. Welcome, welcome. Shed Life Guy is back in. Hey, <laughs> Will. <laughs> welcome, Shed Life Guy. Thanks for tuning. Thanks for tuning in. If you've got any questions, if you've got any wonderful new products that you want to let us know about, you've, you've been very useful the past few weeks to uh, let us know about new uh, electronic wireless drivetrains because that's something we're going to talk about today. Uh, we've got Balls Deep MTB. Hey, mate, from the Sunshine Coast. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we've got Fosto there. Um, saludos. Welcome. Shed Life Guy, wouldn't miss it, mate. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. And we've got Dan Noble. Hello from England. Nice little flag there. Welcome uh, to a slightly warmer part of the world. And we've got, do you know, uh, Timothy's asking about, do you know about Afton shoes? That's a really good question. I know a little bit about them. I saw them at Euro Eurobike, I think it was last year. It might have been the year before. Um, they're doing like a, a flat pedal shoe and also like a trail style or skate style SPD shoe, aren't they? Um, I've not had any experience with them whatsoever myself, so um, um, I've only seen them in the flesh, so I can't give you a whole lot of info about them otherwise. Are you looking at buying a pair, Is that, uh, or have you already got a pair? Uh, Tonyo Boy from Gold Coast here, by the way. Will. Oh, well, welcome from, uh, from the sunny Gold Coast. Probably a little bit warmer up there than it is down here, I would imagine. And Dan Noble's giving the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think um, we're just commenting about the, the, the temperature difference between the UK and Australia, which is a hot topic of conversation, that's for sure. Uh, Timothy, yeah, I have a pair, but still haven't got to try them. Okay, so we're talking about Afton shoes. Timothy, are they flats or clip-ins are you running, the Afton shoes? And it'd be really interesting to know if... Uh, uh, what you're comparing them to as well. Have you? Is this your first pair of flat shoes or your first pair of... Oh, you've got SPDs. Okay, what shoes were you using before and why did you choose the Aftons? I'm really interested because they're, they're pretty new and they're otherwise quite a small brand when it comes to footwear. So it'd be interesting to know why you went with those ones. But um, they do look fantastic. I'll give you that for sure. Uh, Shed Life Guy, my MRP hazard with the Progressive Spring finally arrived. Well, hey, good to hear. Um, also, the Monkey Link modular system. Tell me more. What's the? Oh, this is this. Was this the saddle clip Shed Life Guy? Is this? Uh, we were talking about a little modular system for clipping on um, lights and saddlebags and mudguards and stuff like that. Is that the the Monkey Link modular system? 
Um, or am I way off the ball there? If I, if, is my memory evading me and I can't remember what you're, what you're on about there? <laughs> um, but that's really interesting about the progressive springs. So we're just talking about the MRP hazard, which is a coil sprung shock. Um, MRP's built that hazard shock. Uh, it's named after a trail in Moab in Utah, isn't it? And it's, um, it's designed as kind of like a trail bike um, coil shock. So although coil shocks and coil forks have generally been targeted towards downhill riders, free riders, um, kind of more hardcore park enthusiasts, um, coil suspension definitely getting more popular with trail bikes and enduro bikes. Um, after all, as far as a coil spring is concerned, it really doesn't get any, sim any, any simpler than a coil spring. Um, and it also tends to be uh, smoother because you've got less friction from less seals with an air sprung fork like this one. You've got a couple of seals in here to keep the air inside a seal chamber, uh, where, whereas with a coil spring, you don't have those seals. So in general, you will get a smoother suspension feel. Uh, oh, Sticky Nuts is in the house. Hi guys, welcome Sticky Nuts. Um, Timothy's saying, I've had some Mavic Enduro SPD shoes, but the Afton ones have better protection and they are more waterproof. Oh, that's interesting. And they don't look like bike shoes, so you can still wear them around, I guess. Yeah, that's true. You know, they're kind of more, more of a casual style, which I like as well. Ben Wildman, watching you whilst on the throne. Your voice echoes nicely in here. Well, I'm glad to provide uh, those kind of acoustics for you. I hope it's very soothing and, uh, and I hope your movements are also very soothing as well. Shed life guide, nope, fenders, lights, etc. fully open for anyone to make something that works with their fidlock system. Ah, this is what we were talking about. And uh, that's a great little segue you're providing me there, shed life guy, because I will talk about this fidlock bottle. Um, Tonyo boy um, is saying, Will, I'm really looking into getting the Trans 229er and getting to demo one. What would you think size frame would suit me? I'm 173 centimeters or five foot seven inches tall. Well, I can help you there. Um, I am just ever so slightly taller than you and I am riding a medium in the Trance 29er. Now, as you can tell here, I've got loads of room for my seat post. This is a 125 mil dropper that comes on the medium and the small frames. The large and extra large frames come with a 150 mil dropper, but the medium and small, they come with this guy here. That does mean there's a bit of exposed seat post here. So even if your legs are shorter than mine, even if your saddle height is shorter than mine, there's quite a big range of adjustment there. So at your height at five foot seven, 173 centimeters, you're just two centimeters shorter than me. Um, I think the medium would be a good one to go for. Um, the small is gonna get, it's gonna start to get a bit shorter in that top tube length. Mind you, these trances are pretty long uh, relative to other giant full suspension bikes, I should say that. Uh, relative to a pole or geometron, they're not, um, but relative to other giants and perhaps other um, mass-produced brands on the market like Specialized and Trek and Merida, it's fairly long. I think the reach on this is 442, 443 millimeters. Um, so it's pretty long for, uh, for a 29 trail bike. Um, but still, at your height, I reckon the, uh, the medium would be the way to go. Um, Tonyo boy, awesome Will, thanks for the input. God bless and more power guys. Absolutely, no worries, glad I could help out mate. Balls Deep MTB, how did you find the 115 millimeter travel on the rear trance? Did it feel like enough for aggressive trail running? Great question and a totally valid question as well because the Trance 29er, it's got quite a bit less travel than the Trance 27.5. So this guy has 115 on the back and 130 on the front. Obviously 29 inch wheels, so they provide a different ride characteristic to 27.5 inch wheels. But it is quite a bit less travel than the Trance 27.5, which has 150 and 140 millimeters of travel. Um, 115 on the back of this, it works really, really well. It's ultimately still 115 millimeters. So, um, so where I've noticed that is on kind of bigger hits where a little bit of a little bit of extra insurance is kind of nice from having longer travel on the back of the bike. Um, you do notice it a bit more, but in terms of the quality of the suspension, it's very, very high, very, very supple. Uh, we've got a lovely uh, DPX2 shock on here with a piggyback. Check that little guy out there. Um, so a nice kind of robust, uh, robust enduro style shock on a short travel trail bike. And with that trunnion mount, with the Maestro suspension design, very, very supple, very good small bump sensitivity, really active through the mid-stroke. Um, it does ramp up pretty well. Um, I think if you were hitting much bigger gaps and drops and doubles and just generally being rad, 
Um, I think you might want to put a volume spacer inside that rear shock just to get it to kick up a little bit more towards the end and also to give it a bit more support in the middle of the travel. Um, for aggressive trail riding though, like fast, rapid, you know, rough trail riding, um, I think it works really well out of the box so far. So very, very impressed with the 115 mil of travel on the back of this bike so far. So great question for me. Uh, we've got specialized LH76LUDO. I think you need to work on your YouTube handle. It could be a little bit easier to say. That looks like a car registration plate, but hello, welcome to, uh, the, to the live video. So we've got loads of people tuning in here. Um, so we were just talking before about, um, or Shed Life Guy was bringing up um, in the comment section here about uh, the, was it the Monkey Modular? Monkey Matic modular system, I'm making up words now. I could go through the comments and reread it, but we're talking about uh, magnetic system and we can, oh, uh, Balls Deep MTB. Cheers, mate, I think I will order one today. All right, well, uh, glad, glad I helped you out with that one. Um, yeah, I think it's, so far, I'm really, really impressed with this bike. I think it's fantastic. Um, right, so this is, check this out. Um, this is a Fidlock water bottle. Um, I don't know if you can see that the right way around because this is on the FaceTime camera on my phone. Um, Fidlock water bottle. So it's, um, what, a 600 mil water bottle, I think? Yeah, 600 mil. Um, but it's got this kind of like receiver on the, uh, molded into the underside of the bottle. And it's designed, let me just put that on my leg there, with magnets to just clip right onto the frame. So there's actually um, two magnetic stubs that bolt onto the frame where a bottle cage would normally go. So they use exactly the same two bolts that a bottle cage would fit on. Um, but we've got these two round stubs and they interlock with those two receivers there. There's corresponding magnets up here and it just clips on like that. It's bloody brilliant. And to remove the water bottle, all you do is you grab it and you twist it to the side. Um, in this case, to the right. Um, and then it just unclips. It's super duper easy and you just hover the bottle above and it just clips in so you can feel the magnets. They're quite powerful and it just sucks it down and clips it on. Now I've ridden with this for, I don't know, 18 months or so now. Um, I just found it in the office and decided to bolt it onto the bike. The bottle has never dropped off yet. I've got to find something made of wood. There we go. Touch wood, it's never fallen off yet, which is which I'm really happy about. Um, I'm sure there's, I'm, Maybe it could, I don't know, but you'd have to be doing something really, really rad. Uh, maybe like tail whipping or like bar spinning or something, which thankfully I don't do a lot of. Um, but really, even on rough terrain, it won't come off the, it won't come off the receiver. Um, I just haven't had it pop off. You actually have to manually, physically twist it to the side to undo it. There's a little, you won't be able to see here, but there's a little um, uh, central stub which sits up here and that provides a bit more um, security to the bottle when it's locked in place. So that's a Fidlock water bottle. Um, I don't have a price on that. I seem to recall it being relatively cheap, um, but a really nice design. I quite like it because it looks clean. Um, you don't have like a bottle cage around here. And when you take the bottle off, um, it's much cleaner as well because there's, uh, there's no bottle cage. So very, very simple. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Is that cool? Total gimmick, not interested. Um, have you used Fidlock products elsewhere? Um, because this brand, Fidlock, um, if you've got a uh, laser helmet or a Bell Super DH, they actually make the mag magnetic uh, clip for the chin. Um, so that's the same brand, Fidlock. Um, so they're doing magnet -based, magnetic based products everywhere. Um, I think even the new YT Jeffsy actually has, sorry, I'll get the bike up there, this particular component here actually built into the frame itself. So it gives it a really clean look because you don't have that external, those external stubs there. Um, but yeah, the whole Fidlock bottle and magnetic system seems to be getting more popular. Timothy, because um, I'm looking for a knee frame, but I kind of prefer the old frame. Hold on. Oh, what about the new Strive 29? I think it is kind of, kind of weird, except that the new shapeshifter is better because um, I'm looking for a new frame, but I kind of prefer the old frame. Um, I saw the Strive only a few days ago. I went and dropped off that Neuron test bike back to Canyon, Australia, and uh, they had one of the new Strives there. It looks really, really nice. It was the one with the Mavic wheels with the yellow spoke on it, the D-Max Pro wheels, um, X01 drivetrain, really, really clean. 
I don't know about the new shapeshifter control. I mean, the control itself looks really good, but the way that the dropper post uh, lever bolts onto, the, onto it underneath kind of creates quite a, well, I mean, it's, I guess it's not that much bigger than a front shifter used to be. Uh, remember those? And, uh, but it does look pretty kind of big. It kind of sticks out there. It sort of looks like it's hovering around, around your, the kneecap area. So I'd have to ride one myself to kind of get a feel for that clearance and whether that's a problem or not. Um, but yeah, the new Strive, I think it looks really good. It's sort of a very typical kind of approach from Canyon. Um, you know, nothing too radical, um, but very, you know, meticulously engineered as well. Um, but yeah, I think a few people have looked at that Strive and kind of, wanted it to be perhaps a bit slacker or a bit longer or whatever um, but I think Canyon does a good job of building kind of well-rounded bikes they're not necessarily biased towards just descending or just climbing they're kind of that stride looks like a really nice all-rounder bike particularly with a shapeshifter and now it's made by Fox as well that little shapeshifter shock um, that's a that's that's fantastic I think a, a lot of potential owners will be very happy about the fact that Fox is taking care of both manufacturing and service components for that shapeshifter unit. So that is pretty cool, I think. Uh, we had some more questions. We've got people tuning in here live. If you're just joining us, welcome. Thanks for joining Fresh Goods Down Under. Um, and uh, Timothy is, oh yeah, so he's mentioning about the Bell Super DH and I love it, especially the magnetic clip. Totally a big fan of that Super DH. That is a really, really good helmet. And we were just talking, about this magnetic bottle. So this is a Fidlock bottle and uh, Fidlock also make the magnetic clasps that some brands use for the chin strap on their helmets um, amongst other things as well. So that's pretty neat. Uh, what we're gonna talk about. So I wanna talk about the grips on this bike because I've changed these out. I'd love to hear from you guys. If you have a particular favorite grip, um, I'm on a bit of a mission at the moment to try out different lock-on grips. Um, really simple thing, usually fairly cheap relative to other parts on the bike anyway. Um, I think these DMR grips, they're less than 20 quid. They might be around 16 or 17 quid for the pair. Um, oh, Craig Bromley is just asking, how heavy is the Fidlock? That's a really good question, Craig. I've not weighed it. It can't be that much more than a standard bottle cage. I, I'm guessing it'll be heavier than, you know, a super lightweight carbon bottle cage. Um, but it's not too bad. At the moment, it's kind of heavy because it has water in it. Um, it'll be lighter without water though. Shed Life Guy is saying, there are all German companies. What sold me on the rear fender is it's twin pivot with a built-in light. You can set the mount in any axis, then adjust the fender to get the perfect setup. That sounds really neat. We're gonna have to see a photo of all this. I'm really interested um, on what that looks like, Shed Life Guy. Uh, Timothy's saying, Ergon GD1. Those are very, very nice grips. Um, they've got the, the sort of tapered profile, aren't they? They're thinner in the middle and they gently taper to a thicker outside, which, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, these are DMR Death Grips. These are currently one of my favorite grips on the market at the moment. Uh, they come in a couple of different versions. Actually, there's loads of different versions they come in. This is the flange -less grip. So normally DMR Death Grips or the traditional ones have like a big flange around on the inside, just between the lock-on and the rubber grip. Um, I don't really like that because I've got little hands and uh, that, that flange tends to catch my thumbs when I'm going to hit the shifter or go to hit the dropper post. Um, Shed Life Guy, how would I send you pictures? Can you add them into the comment section here, Shed Life Guy? Maybe try that if that's an option. I don't know if you can. Um, but yeah, so these are flangeless uh, death grips and they come in thick or thin. I've got the thin ones, I like a nice thin grip. Again, I've got sort of small to medium sized hands. so. Um, generally, it's a good idea to set your grip thickness depending on how big your hand is. So the bigger your hand, the thicker the grip, really. Um, this is the soft compound. Um, so really nice, soft, tactile. It's got ridges underneath the bottom here. It's got a knurl pattern on top and a mushroom pattern on the inside. Um, really good combo. It's a really tactile, easy grip to kind of, you know when you're kind of bashing down the trail and you're kind of moving about and your hands might be moving about on the grip? Without looking down, like without physically looking down at the grip, you can very quickly tell whereabouts you are on the handlebar because it's such a tactile pattern and it's very clear as to whereabouts you are on the grip. So I really like these. Um, I ride them with and without gloves. They do chew you up a little bit if you're not wearing gloves, uh, particularly if it's a bit sweaty. 
Uh, Timothy, is it true the DMR death grip wear out quite fast? Yeah, well, look, I've had this for a while and these are still looking fairly good, um, but they do a race day, I think it's called the race compound or the race day compound. They're even softer and those ones are pretty much for race day, kind of like race day tires, you know, super sticky compound that um, is going to sacrifice durability for grip. So, um, so these aren't the race day compound, um, but they are pretty soft as they are. So far, they're wearing pretty well. Shed Life Guy, sorry, YouTube won't let me have. Have you got a Dropbox at Single Track Towers? We do, but I cannot remember it off the top of my head. Um, why don't you just send it into my email address? I'm just going to broadcast this on live video. Um, it's uh, will, W-I-L, at singletrackworld.com. Um, so I'm about to be bombarded with a load of spam mail, but as long as you send me the photo, it'll be worth it. <laughs> um, Balls Deep MTB, have you still got the stock tires on the trance? Have you experimented with something wider? That is a very good question. I haven't had a chance to try a wider tire in the rear. I think if, uh, if you joined the live Q&A video on this bike from a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about tire clearance on the back. This has a 2.3 inch Maxxis Minion tire. Um, now, here's something perhaps you might find interesting, or not. Um, the Minion DHF normally comes on the front of this bike, and the DHR normally comes on the back. But I've switched them around, um, because I find the DHF a little bit faster rolling, and I find the DHR a little bit grippier, uh, particularly in the turns. It's a pretty aggressive front tyre, um, but I like that. It gives you a load of braking traction on kind of rough, steep trails. So I've switched them around. You don't have to do that, but, um, but I decided to because I prefer them that way. Um, this is a 2.3 inch Minion DHF and it's a 2.3 inch DHR on the front. Um, now there's loads of clearance in the back of this frame for this 2.3 inch tire. I reckon you could get a 2.5 in there pretty comfortably, um, but I will find that out for you, Balls Deep MTB, who is asking if I've experimented with anything wider on this bike. The fork will clear quite a bit wider. I think you can go up to a 2.8 now on these Fox forks, um, at least a 2.6, maybe a 2.8. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to try this bike with say 2.5 rubber, turn it into a really aggressive kind of downhill oriented bike. That said, with this tire combo on here, they're not the fastest rolling tires, and I think they weigh in at nearly a kilogram each. They're around that sort of 930, 950 gram mark for the, for the front and rear tires. So, you know, it's quite a lot of rotational mass for a trail bike. So. It depends on where your priorities are for, uh, for acceleration, climbing, uh, speed, um, uh, versus you know, downhill traction predictability and that kind of thing. So I think it's a pretty good match for this bike. Um, if anything, I kind of like the idea of running maybe like a Minion SS on the back. Um, it's super dry and dusty here at the moment. It's summer in Australia. So a lot of the local trails are very rocky. They're very loose, um, but they're quite dry and dusty. And I think that Minion SS or some kind of uh, semi-slick tire on the back would be a nice option to kind of give this bike a little bit more speed, a little bit more climbing speed and a bit better acceleration without sacrificing corner and grip too much. So that might be a tire worth checking out. If any of you guys have got any recommendations for different tires I can try on this bike, let me know. I'd love to hear your recommendations, um, not just on grips. We're talking about uh, different lock-on grips here, um, but also about tires. And just to go back to these DMR death grips, um, the stock giant grips, not a big fan of. Um, I find them, the compound's a bit firm, the density and the, the, the pattern is, just doesn't quite suit me. Um, so I put on these death grips because I did have them um, hanging about in my workshop toolbox and a uh, big fan of these, very, very nice. Uh, I've had some more questions coming through. We've got people tuning in live here. Welcome to the live video. Um, modders, I'm still loving my Maxxis 2.8. Yeah, that's a big tire, Modders. Uh, what Maxxis 2.8s do you have? Are you running something like um, a Recon or a High Roller or a DHR or have you got something a bit faster rolling than that? 2.8 inch, that is a big plus tire. And we're talking 29 or 27.5. What kind of bike have you got them on as well? Let me know, I'd love to know what bike you're riding and uh, what kind of setup you've got on there. Um, it's always find really interesting about the way that stock bikes come built, but how you can change a few components on there and completely, or well, complete, yeah, completely change the personality of the bike by putting on a different handlebar or stem, um, by putting on different tires, um, or what I did with that Canyon Neuron last week by changing the fork offset and giving it slightly different handling. That was really interesting kind of process. 
Um, so one thing I want to talk about here, which is right in my face, so I might as well talk about it. Last week we had this bag arrive. This is from Bike Bag Dude. And this is a top tube bag. Um, I guess if you're a triathlete, they'd be called a feed, you know, top tube feed bag. This is where you put all your gels, um, all of your EPO for your racing. Um, but for me, this is kind of a really useful device to carry a spare tube. Um, I've got tubeless plugs in here, tie levers, um, a tube repair kit. Um, I've got I've got my tire pressure gauge, which is uh, which follows me on every single ride. Here we've got uh, tire levers, CO2, um, patches, we've got a spare valve in there as well. Uh, we've got a little valve tightening tool, very important. Um, I've had that happen enough to me before. Spare chain links as well. Um, we've got Max Alami, this is a, a tubeless repair, repair kit. So they're the little plugs that you poke into the, the, into the tire carcass itself to plug them up. Um, some spare zip ties we've got here, or cable ties if you will. Um, CO2 head as well, and the tubes in uh, tucked in there nice and neatly as well. So it, it basically carries kind of all the emergency essentials that I might need. Um, you know, if I get stuck out in the woods um, because I've got a silly puncture or something stupid's happened and I need to repair the bike to keep riding. Um, this is kind of my emergency kit. But what I like about this style of bag is it's really easy to take off. It's got two Velcro straps. We've got one here, one here. Sorry, three Velcro straps, two underneath the top tube and one up at the head tube. That keeps it quite stable on the bike, um, but it also means it's really easy to take off. And I can put this onto another test bike quite easily uh, and quickly and know that I've got all those essentials with me on every ride. I don't have to worry if, I'm, if I've got all that stuff with me in my backpack. I know that I've physically got it right in front of me. So um, yeah, quite, quite useful to have all that uh, handy. Um, and uh, you know to carry emergency gels and stuff like that too. So uh, I'd love to know what you think about that. I think it's a, it's a pretty big bag. Um, so far I like it. The only thing I don't like is that the the zip kind of makes a bit of noise there when uh, when bouncing around on the trail. Um, so I don't know if there's a fix that I can you hear that? Yeah, if you're bouncing around on the trail, it does get a little bit distracting. So I'll I'll speak to Keaton at Bike Bag Dude and see if there's a a hack or some kind of solution to that noise. But so far, I think it works really well. Uh, Modos is saying he's got a white 905. Oh yeah, that's like the, uh, the trail hardtail. We tested one of those last year. I didn't, but um, the girls did, and they absolutely loved it. Um, thought it was a wicked hardtail. So you've got a Recon 2.8 on the back and a High Roller 2.8 on the front. That is a really good tire combo. That High Roller, that plus size High Roller, is absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Um, 2.8 inches wide. Probably not the fastest tyre, but at least you've got the recon on the back, so a um, bit faster rolling. Um, rear tyre and something up front with a bit more cornering tread and a bit more predictability for rough kind of, uh, I presume, British riding. Whereabouts are you from, Modders? Um, I'm making an assumption there, it'd be great to know, but if you've got a white 905 hardtail, my spidey senses tell me you're probably UK based. Um, but let me know whereabouts in the world you're watching from. We've got more people tuning in live here. Welcome to the live feed. Um, this is Fresh Goods Down Under, uh, where we're talking about test bikes, we're talking about test product, and we're talking about new product that's turned up um, or has been on the Single Track website this week. I've got a few things I want to talk about here. Um, Shed Life Guy was chatting before about an MRP hazard coil shock. Now, last week, I think it was over the weekend actually, we had a review go up. Oh, Modders is saying an absolute hoot to ride. The white 905 hardtail, yeah. Um, Timothy, I use a Schwab Magic Mary front and Hans Dump on the rear, nice. Yeah, the Magic Mary, that is a really, really good sticky tire. Can recommend that one for sure. Um, not the fastest, not the most durable, um, but very, very good grip. Um, shit to a blanket grip, I believe is, is the uh, correct term. Um, so coil shocks. We reviewed, or I didn't test it myself, but there was uh, one of our testers, Tom Nash, reviewed. Oh, Modders, UK, your spidey senses are on point. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, uh, or happy Thursday evening, Modders, by the way. It's Friday morning here in Australia, but it's Thursday, more, Thursday evening where you are. So uh, I hope you're having a wonderful evening uh, there in the UK. Timothy, and for XC, I use Continental X King front and Race King rear. Nice combination. Yeah, good good, uh, good combos that Timothy's running there with 
front tire slightly wider, slightly uh, toothier on the front where you want that traction, you want that stability, you can get away with the rear tire being a little bit lighter, a little bit faster, and sometimes a little bit narrower as well. Um, basically, wherever the front tire is going to go, the rear is probably going to follow, so you can get away with that rear tire being a little bit quicker. Um, I want to talk about the Push 11.6 coil shock. This is a 1300 pound coil shock. Um, now, Push, of course, is a aftermarket suspension brand. They make uh, fork seals, they make um, bearing kits for rear shocks, or sorry, bushing kits for rear shocks. Um, but they do make, or they have for the last couple of years, they make a coil shock called the 11.6. We've just finished testing one. Um, it's nearly 1,300 pounds for a rear shock. It's extraordinarily expensive. Would any of you, would it, any of you watching this at the moment, would you spend 1,300 quid on a rear shock? Is that something that you think, yeah, I can see the value in that. Um, I've not ridden a Push 11.6 shock before myself, so I can't comment on whether it's as life-changing as Push says it is, but I can say it looks really damn special. They're an amazing piece of kit, um, all made in the USA, um, loads of adjustability, crazy patented dual overhead valve system. Um, Tom was really, really impressed with the shock that he wrote, as he should be for that kind of price. Um, but that's a review on singletrackworld.com at the moment. If you want to read about the most expensive shock on the market, the Push 11.6, jump on the website and have a look at that review. The other thing I want to talk to you about is wireless shifting, and I'd love to hear your guys' opinions. Um, and when I say guys, I mean guys and girls. Um, your opinion about the SRAM wireless shifting and the wireless dropper post as well. So yesterday, the news finally dropped, the embargo lifted on SRAM's new AXS wireless drivetrain. Oh, Timothy, it's really nice and also with a SAR spring. Oh, have you got a push 11.6 shock, Timothy? Uh, and if so, what bike do you have that on? I'd be very, very interested to know. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any uh, feedback on the SRAM wireless derailleur and shifter, is that is that an upgrade you would make? Um, is that something that interests you? You think, yes, get rid of cables, I don't want them, and electronic shifting, all about it. Um, there are definitely a lot of benefits available there with electronic shifting, but is it worth the money? Is it worth perhaps the extra complexity? Um, I don't know. Again, I've not ridden AXS yet. Um, perhaps it's simpler than a cable system. I don't don't know, but uh, but it's certainly um, not not a cheap upgrade. Oh, Timothy's saying my brother does on an evil following. Nice, evil with the push eleven six shock. That thing is going to be plush. I tested an evil following uh, about a year and a half ago, and that bike was outrageous fun. It was actually the same color as this, bright metallic green, and that was a beautiful bike. I can only imagine what it would be like with a coil shock on the back of it. Um, so yeah, if you guys got any comments about SRAM AXS, that's the new Eagle wireless drivetrain, um, drop them in the comment section below. I'd love to hear what you think about it, whether it's an upgrade you foresee in your future, um, or whether it's one of those super high-end products that we'll all lust after but never be able to afford. I know I won't be able to afford it. Modders, with wireless shifting, what happens on multi-day rides with little to no chance of recharging? And what happens if it just fails? Nice idea, but thinking face. Good question, Modders. I believe the battery life on that rear derailleur um, is at basically at a minimum around 20 to 25 hours of ride time, but up to 40 hours of ride time. Of course, it depends how much you're shifting. The more you shift, the more you're gonna run that battery down. Um, but you can get replacement batteries and they're um, a really little 20 gram kind of uh, clip-on battery pack. Uh, you can get spares for them. And um, so I think if you, were, if you were serious enough about multi-day stage racing, being able to buy a second battery would, be, uh, would make sense. And they take one out of charge from full flat. So even if at the end of every day of your stage race, you just plugged it in to charge it up for an hour, it'd be ready to go for another 20 to 25 hours to 40 hours, I think, is uh, what SRAM is saying you can get out of those derailleurs. So I don't think it would be uh, that much of a problem. As to actual problems, if it stops working, well, that can happen. It can happen with a cable system if the cable rips open. Um, it can happen with DI2 if the, uh, the electronic wire gets tugged out of the derailleur. Um, and I'm sure it will be able to happen with a wireless system somehow. I know SRAM spent a lot of time testing and developing that particular system, so I'm sure it's as robust as possible. Um, but it's mountain biking. Stuff fails, doesn't it? Um, so in that case, I don't know. If you were multi-day stage racing, 
you would almost think about having a spare derailleur, wouldn't you? Whether it was cable or, uh, or electronic. Expensive, but uh, if you take your racing seriously and you're worried about that kind of mechanical, then uh, a spare derailleur probably makes sense. We've got some more questions coming through here from uh, Balls Deep MTB. Looking forward to 2025 when wireless shifting is affordable. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you mean, hey. It'd be nice to see that wireless um, technology trickle down. But I, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but SRAM's red group set, the wireless ETAP red group set, um, so far hasn't trickled down any lower, has it? It's kind of stayed at that very, very top of the, top of the range, premium, ultra premium level. Um, we haven't seen force or rival kind of adopt wireless shifting yet. So yeah, I don't know if it's gonna happen on the mountain bike either. To, to be honest, given the cost of that system, I mean, it's good 30% more expensive than a cable Eagle XX1 drivetrain, the Eagle XX1 AXS drivetrain. Um, I think it's gonna stay at that super premium end. So sorry, that's a bit pessimistic of me, but I don't foresee it kind of trickling down. Uh, more comments coming through here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Timothy is saying, I like that you can use the batteries for the dropper and the gears. Yes, Timothy has uh, picked up there. That's a really good point. So the new reverb dropper post, which is wireless, I think that is fantastic. Very expensive though. I don't know if you've seen the pricing on those reverb AXS dropper posts but it does come with a clip-on battery on the back of it, and it's the same battery. So if you had a, rev a wireless reverb and you had wireless shifter, AXS shift, uh, derailleur, I should say, you could unclip the battery from the dropper and swap it onto the derailleur. So you do have that flexibility. Very good point, Timothy. Um, or, and the derailleur is so neat. Yeah, it is. The other thing about that derailleur is it has that crash function built into it, which I think is amazing. That is a really cool technology. So it's got like a, um, a slip clutch or... Um, I forget what they're calling it, but it's, uh, it's a, like a crash clutch. So if you whack the derailleur really hard, it disengages the electronic or the mechanical cogs inside the derailleur. It disengages them and it allows the derailleur to move inboard and absorb that lateral force. And then it wakes up again, clips back into gear and resets to the last gear that you're in. That was, that's amazing. Um, and from all reports, you can basically punch the derailleur and it will, it will move in board and then it will come back out board, back to the gear it was in and resume normal function, which is pretty crazy, really. Um, really, it should do because a lot of these new generation derailers, particularly the SRAM derailers, they're very big, they're very chunky, they sit quite far out from the frame, uh, very, very close in harm's way if, you, if you're riding through really rocky terrain where the rocks are close either side of the trail. Um, then those derailers can be right in the way of getting clipped by a rock. So the fact that it has that crash functionality built into it, I think is really, really cool. Um, Shed Life Guy, all right, so we've got, oh yeah, the Bluetooth system. Um, so Shed Life Guy's talking about a wireless shifter and derailleur that he's using at the moment. My Bluetooth system is flawless. Archer D1X, minus 50 hours of riding to charge them. You just put in another two AA batteries. Yeah, right, so it's not a rechargeable lithium ion battery. A couple of double A's in there. And is that in the derailleur or is that in the shifter? Um, mine costs 300 pounds. Yeah, that's really good, hey. Shed Life Guy, 700 pounds for a dropper. Um, SRAM also stated in print, this is primarily for XC. Yeah, 700 pounds for a dropper post. That is crazy money. But I guess if you're racing, I guess if you really want a clean look, um, I guess if you want that wireless compatibility with the shifter, because they are, they will talk to each other. You can have one, one shifter basically talk to the uh, the dropper post and the derailleur, which is pretty neat. Um, yeah, it's going to be expensive. Uh, Timothy, by the way, this is the first live I watch and is really interesting. Well done. Oh, thanks for uh, thanks for the nice comment, Timothy. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, and as I said earlier on in the video, I'm going to be doing these live videos every Friday morning, Australia time, or Thursday evening, uh, UK time, European time. Um, so plan is to talk about test bikes that we've got on the go, test products that we have here that I've got on the bike, um, and just basically to answer any questions that you guys have got about uh, bikes that you're checking out or about the, the test bikes and product in question. So by all means, let me know what questions you've got and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, but I think the last thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is another article that's on the Single Track website at the moment, and that's the Trust Linkage Fork. Has anyone seen the Trust Linkage Fork? I believe it's called The Message. Uh, not unlike Evil Bikes, where it's the following or the calling. Um, it's The Message. So has anyone seen that Linkage Fork? And what do you think about it? Is it sort of thing that you can see the benefits and you love the idea 
of, uh, of, of a linkage fork and you can see the limitations of telescopic forks. Timothy says yes. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's hit the news pretty hard, hasn't it, last uh, month or so. The hype around that, that message fork has been huge. Um, I think it looks really cool, really wacky. I love that it's something different. I can see the benefits in the design, but I really love to get a ride of it myself. We have one on for test at the moment. And uh, if you want to know more about it, um, Hannah's done a live unboxing video. Uh, we've also got a first look at the fork. So loads of photos, loads of detail about how to set it up and how it's meant to ride. Timothy, it looks pretty neat and I want to try one and it, uh, to see if it is plush as people say. Yeah, I know. Uh, the people who have ridden it have been really impressed. I have read some slightly conflicting reviews online and these are all early ride reviews. Um, one of our contributors, uh, one of our local testers, David Haywood, is on the fork right now. And uh, I believe in my email inbox is a first ride review. So I'll go through that today and hopefully get it up as soon as possible because um, I'd love to know how it rides. And I'm sure you guys would be interested to know how that trust message fork rides. Even if it rides really well, is it worth 2,700 US dollars? Yes, nearly 3,000 American dollars for that fork. That is incredibly expensive. We've just been talking about SRAM AXS wireless and a 700 pound dropper post. We've just been talking about Push 11.6 coil shock, which is nearly 1,300 pounds. And now we're talking about the Trust Message Fork, which is nearly 3,000 American dollars. So we're crossing, crossing the world's currencies at the moment, but you get the idea, all these things are bloody expensive. Um, Shed Life Guy, no, SRAM's website says you can have a left and right lever. You can't run the dropper from the shifter paddle. That's interesting, because um, I did read on uh, one of my industry peers um, articles yesterday that you could have one shifter set up to operate the reverb and the rear derailleur. So uh, thanks to the pickup shed life guy, I'll have a look at that. Look, in, look, I'll have a look into that to find out um, if that's the case. Um, but if you've read that on the SRAM website that the one shifter can only operate a derailleur or only operate a dropper post, then I'm sure you're right. I'm sure SRAM's right. Um, but there you go. Interesting, uh, interesting stuff. Uh, Reese Powell. Oh, hello, Reese. My uh, my old neighbour from Tobidon's tuned in live. Welcome to the live Q and A. Welcome to Australia, um, or well, a shed. Could be anywhere, really. Um, love the idea. Looks like uh, looks like something from a different planet. Yeah, we're talking about the Trust Message Linkage Fork. That thing is bananas, isn't it? Um, I think the looks are going to be are very polarizing. I think some people are just like, it doesn't matter how good that fork is. I'm not riding it. It looks horrible. Um, and other people are kind of like, hey, that's cool. That's different. So yeah, definitely a polarizing kind of fork there. Um, Timothy, yeah, you can customize it, customize it however you want for the paddles normally. So we're talking about the SRAM AXS system. So we've got some conflicting information here um, about the new AXS wireless shifter. Um, I'm sure we can ask Hannah who did check out that system earlier this week and wrote the article. If you want to know more about it, um, there's an article on our website at the moment on singletrackworld.com about new, SRAM's new wireless Eagle drivetrain. I'm calling it ETAP Eagle um, because uh, that's what we called it, I don't know, six months ago when we ran a spy story about it, but it's called AXS and uh, pronounced AXIS. That's how they're, they're going for it. Wireless shifting, wireless dropper post, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the big news stories hitting the website this week. Um, and uh, yeah, we've just been chatting about this giant trance 29er test bike. Um, I'll have more ride uh, information coming on this soon. Did you guys see the Canyon video that I did yesterday or published yesterday? And that was on the Canyon Neuron CF test bike I've been riding for the past couple of months. I just did an onboard uh, ride review type thing and basically it's me with a GoPro on the chest mount and a lapel microphone um, kind of talking about the bike whilst I'm riding it. Um, I nearly crashed my brains out so that was pretty exciting. I'm really glad I caught that on camera um, but I'm hoping to do a similar video for this bike here so stay tuned for that one. Uh, Shed Life Guy. The kicker is the app that states dropper left side only. So Shed Life Guy is going through the manuals on the SRAM website at the moment for AXS. So I reckon, uh, I reckon he's got the hot information right there. Uh, Reese Powell, just like when Cannondale did the lefty, something just didn't seem right. Yeah, totally. The lefty is still like mind blowing, isn't it? Especially that lefty Ocho, the, the single crown version of the lefty. It doesn't even have the dual crown anymore. That thing looks wild. It looks like it shouldn't work and it should fold in half, but it doesn't. Um, Timothy, not yet. I will look after school tomorrow. All right, so these guys are, we're debating about the SRAM AXS wireless system. So uh, we're trying to work out whether you need both paddles to run both the rear derailleur and a dropper post, 
or if you can use one shifter paddle to operate the dropper and the shifter uh, and the rear derailleur. Personally, I think I'd rather have two paddles anyway. I'd rather my left thumb and the left side of my brain, or is it right side of the brain that controls your left side of your body? Ooh. Uh, anyway, uh, I'd rather the left side controlling the dropper post and my right hand uh, controlling the, the rear derailleur. Uh, oh, you're talking about the Canyon video. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, check it out if you get the chance. Um, as I said, I nearly crashed my brains out. That was pretty hilarious. Um, but it was also a bit of an opportunity to show you what I was testing on that bike. Um, some of the local trails that I got the bike onto for testing. Um, and yeah, just a bit of fun really. So yeah, let me know what you think of that video. I'm hopefully doing one on this bike very soon. And uh, next week when we do this live video, I will have another test bike for you guys. So we'll do a live Q&A um, on an undisclosed test bike. It's fairly new, um, not brand new, but it's fairly new. And uh, I'm kind of excited about it. So uh, yeah, get tuned for, get, stay tuned for next Friday's live Q&A video, uh, Fresh Goods Down Under, which I'll be doing every week on Friday morning, uh, Australian time or Thursday evening UK time. Um, right, Thunderstruck Coach is just pointing out $800 for the dropper and $350 street price for the new version of the Magura Viron. Ooh, good question. I don't know. Um, I've not used the second generation Viron. I've used the first generation Viron and it was good. I love the wireless design. Anything that gets rid of internal cables in a frame, fantastic. That Viron, the problem I had though was with the lag time. So when you hit the button and the lag time between hitting the button and the valve opening inside the dropper and allowing it to compress or extend was quite long. Um, that took a bit of getting used to. Once you get used to it, so Thunderstruck Coach, second gen is much quicker. Yeah, that's right. We had one of the guys test it. I think the review went up on the website a good few months ago. He put, oh, I, I don't know, nine months of testing into that dropper and it was faultless. I mean, it's Magura, so uh, German brand, so there's a lot of emphasis on engineering and durability and it is much, much faster. It's, there is still a lag time there. As to the new Reverb AXS dropper post, I have no idea how fast or how slow the lag is between hitting the button and the dropper post um, opening and allowing uh, movement. So, but that would be a really interesting comparison. We'd love to know what the, uh, the lag time is between those two droppers. But yeah, good point there that you can get the Mirga of Iron for a lot cheaper than you can get that current Reverb AXS. But I think SRAM and RockShox is going for the whole integrated system. And I kind of understand that if you've got both uh, the same paddle on the right and the left, um, very similar shape, you know, it's, it just tends to be a little bit easier on the brain. I know that sounds like a really small thing, but uh, when you've got a dropper post lever that feels like a front shifter, um, it just tends to be a bit more ergonomic and a bit easier to hit, a bit more intuitive to hit, I find anyway. So I know what SRAM's going for there. It's that whole system integration. Um, you can use the one app to control your dropper post and your shifter and derailleur, which is pretty cool. How nuts is that, that in 2019, we're talking about an app on your phone and controlling the shifting on your mountain bike. That is just, it's worth stepping back and just thinking, that is properly bananas, hey? <laughs> uh, but anyway, on that note, I'm gonna finish up this live video. I really wanna say thank you for everyone who's tuned in live, everyone who's asked questions, who's commented through the video. Um, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I'm gonna be doing this video every Friday, um, every Friday morning Australian time, every Thursday UK time. So by all means, tune in for next week. I'm gonna be talking at a brand new test bike. So we're gonna have um, loads of detail, loads of information about a new test bike. So make sure you tune in next week for Fresh Goods Down Under. I'm gonna head away and uh, hopefully get some riding done this weekend. I hope you've got some riding plans wherever you are in the world and that the weather is shining on you where, wherever that might be. If it's not, then uh, I hope you get a good feed and uh, some beers in and uh, catch up with some mates over the weekend. Uh, Shed Life Guy, I'll be back. I certainly hope so. You've been fantastic. I love the input from all of you guys. This is really cool. Makes it more interesting for me as well when I get to learn new things in these videos. Um, Thunderstruck Coach, keep up the videos and take care of my daughter who's in school in Melbourne. Oh, fantastic. All right, well, best of luck to her. Um, I guess she'll be just starting the school year uh, around about now. All the kids are uh, back at school. Reese Powell gives the thumbs up. Try and catch you again next week. Thanks, Reese, my old neighbor from Tobberden. Um, thanks for tuning in. Say hello to the family and hope Emmy's feeling better as well. Uh, Lundholm, happy trails. Indeed. Thanks, guys.